ever, so we're doing a hybrid live event, so yes. And a big thank you to everyone, all of our, our, our volunteers and uh, loved ones of volunteers who helped get us set up so that we could do this. It's so exciting to be here together with you all. Um, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is James Conley. I am the co-chair of the board of directors of the Gerber Hard. Um, I am thrilled to see you all here. Uh, this is usually where I do my little song and dance pitch, but um, you know, we really, we could not be here doing the things that we're doing without all of you, without your attendance, your time as volunteers and community members with an interest in us. And of course, you know, part of that goes in, uh, part of the things that help us keep our, our lights on and the doors open is donations of any kind. Um, <laughs> But uh, donations don't just have to be financial. Um, we have a lot of exciting things planned for the next couple of years already here at the Gerber Heart. This has been a banner year for us. We've been going through a lot of change. We've had the phenomenal Unboxing Queer History podcast, Woo! which so many people have been wonderful. That has been phenomenal. We have welcomed a new uh, uh, operations director for the library, Aaron Bell, who is here with us right now. <laughs> And we uh, are celebrating our 40th anniversary as an institution. I know, I can't believe it. She looks so good. <laughs> and we actually got to have our first major sponsored Pride Parade float this year. So if you, got, if you managed to see us in the parade, well, a bunch of us got to march. It was really, really exciting. Uh, Hyatt Hotels uh, 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 worked with us. We got to design the float. They let us do all the stuff. It was really, really, really fun. So. Um, you know, one of the things that I wanted to talk about is that, you know, in addition to uh, financial things that people might have if you're looking for end of your giving, if you're just looking to, to give out to an organization you believe in and that you love, if you see something in the exhibit today or hear something in this panel discussion that sparks a lot of joy in you, a lot of recognition, I know that's why I'm here. I was a volunteer for six years before I joined the board and um, I can see us just, we have this propulsive nature right now, and that's what, you know, was so exciting to join the board this year. But even if you can't con contribute financially, there are a lot of things that you can do to help our organization. Um, we have been volunteer run for most of the 40 years that we've been in operation. We have only a few, I think currently three staff positions, including our operations director. So if you have time, we would love to work with you. If you have community connections, we are always, always, and I know that our exhibit curators will probably talk about this when they go into the, how the research process was, but we are always looking to connect with new community organizations. You know, one of the things we've really emphasized this year is that we need to be good community stewards as we grow um, and make that first effort to reach out to organizations. So if you're part of an organization or if you know an organization that might work well with us, please shoot us an email, come talk to one of us. Tonight, uh, let us know. Let's make that connection happen. Also, as members of the community, you may have items in your closets, in your attics, as they are often found, <laughs> sometimes in basements, hopefully not in basements, uh, <laughs> that, are, that are part of our legacy, whether you were part of an organization, an activist group, or you helped create something, or you volunteered with another group in the city. Those are all really valuable things to us, and if you're looking for a place to, to a repository for those things that can be climate control, take good care of them, and then make them available to the public in things like these exhibits, um, we would be so grateful to, uh, to talk to you about those items. There are so many different ways that you can help Gerber Heart last another 40 years, and um, we're just so thankful for all of you being here today. And, and for this opportunity to talk to you. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome you all to the exhibit and I will pass on the mic to our real experts. Thank you. <laughs> It hasn't always been sure that we were going to be able to have a gathering as large as this. 
So it's really nice to have everyone in the same place physically and also virtually. Um, but I'll let the other cur cur curators, Justin went, also I'm Anna. <laughs> 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 um, I'll start with that. Um, I'll let my co-curators here, Jess and Witt, talk more about what our research in this exhibit turned into. Um, but we started with uh, the task of commemorating Il uh, Illinois decriminalizing sodomy in 1961. So this is when we started this research 60 years ago. Um, and they, Illinois was the first state to do this, to decriminalize sodomy. And so we wanted to combine the legal coding um, that was strategically designed to target queer people and the other side of things, which was um, the community codes, the in-community codes that queer people made in order to signal to each other covertly. And that is how we at, arrived at our title, Decoded, um, and that the exhibit kind of explores both, both sides of these things, legal and in-community. Um, so with that, I'll let, I'll let Jess give their little blurb. Yeah. Hi, uh, well, thank you so much for coming. Oh, this is really exciting. So, as, um, I'm Jess. Um, as Anna has said, I've been working on it almost a year. Um, I was one of the initial people that joined the team. Um, and speaking of like calls to volunteer, um, I am up here as proof that anyone can help curate an exhibit. <laughs> uh, my, my background is in, in research, and I joined the team because I wanted to learn how to use these really wonderful archives. Um, so when we started with this like idea of like talking about the decriminalization of sodomy, um, I was not excited about the legal codes part of it, to be perfectly frank. That's a lot of really dry reading that my brain was just like, eh. But the things that were really exciting for me were the chance to go back into those archives and start to open up those boxes and find the actual in-person materials. Um, and start to read the like first person accounts. So we're reading articles from Natasheen and like getting to see what people are saying at the time. We're getting to read um, transcripts from oral histories from these people that were on the ground that are telling them stories. And up to today, where we got to talk to Mr. Steinecker over in the back, uh, David Steinecker, whose name you'll see in the exhibit. Um, we get to now talk to someone who was there, who we've written about in the exhibit, and then hear their words um, on that, and that just brings my heart joy. Um, so really excited to share all this with you today. Um, I'm going to pass it over to Witt. <laughs> Hi, everybody. My name is Witt. I am the archivist here at Gerber Hart. Um, I've been volunteering, working at this institution for almost four years now, and I love every aspect of it. I'm really excited to see so many people here today. As James said, this is our first in-person opening since the pandemic. So just to see the turnout and the amount of cool, queer, gay people that are here is just, it brings my heart so much joy. And speaking of joy, it brings me even more joy to be able to bring the stories that we have here at Gerber Heart hidden away in our archives and our special collections and make them accessible for people. That's what these um, curated exhibits, done 100% by volunteers here at Gerber Heart, are for. And being able to make those stories accessible is the first step in us learning about ourselves feeling comfortable with our histories, celebrating them as well. And I really hope that you all enjoy the exhibit as much as we enjoyed making it. Um, hopefully you won't suffer as we suffered <laughs> putting it together. We were definitely not here until 1 a.m. I don't care what our stories on Instagram said. It's all a lie. Um, but yeah, extremely excited to share this with you. I'm gonna keep my um, words brief just so we can get to our amazing um, speakers, Owen Keenan and Kate Redburn that we have here today. Um, but yeah, thank you all for coming out and uh, really excited to have this exhibit opening with all of you. And with that said, our first guest speaker today is Kate Redburn. And actually, Anna, you probably um, can say just a brief introduction to Kate since Anna worked closest with Kate, actually got us in contact with them uh, to begin with. So Anna, do you want to just talk, give Kate the briefest, most wonderful introduction, and then Kate will hand it over to you. Yes, absolutely. So I first came upon Kate's name um, back this winter, maybe, I don't know, I found you when um, trying to do 
uh, yeah, research on, on history of, of queer coding and law. And then I came upon this person at Yale who is doing their JD, PhD in, in exactly that. Um, and I'm sure that they can say more about um, what, they, what they specialize in and what their current research is. Um, but it's been really so amazing to be able to, to work with Kate here um, about uh, what they can, can you know, contribute to um, what we've been talking about as well as uh, just their own research and stories. I was reviewing their paper just this morning and it was really inspiring. Um, and we also, through them, were able to get in contact um, with some first person accounts of um, people who were um, involved in these cases back in the day and were the defense attorneys and were um, the people who you know, were being convicted. So um, it's yeah, such a pleasure to work with them and so pleased to introduce them. Great. Is that my cue? Can you hear me? Yeah, awesome. Well, thank you so much for that introduction. And also, thank you for, you know, including me in your curatorial process and for letting me zoom in here from New York. I wish I could be there with you all, um, but hopefully I'll get to see the exhibit when I'm in Chicago in the fall. So, um, hello, everybody. Uh, yeah, so, so as Anna mentioned, um, I'm actually an incoming academic fellow at Columbia Law School, um, and I do legal history work about uh, trans legal history and the history of the conservative legal movement. Um, and I just thought I would share a little bit of my research about the fall of anti-cross-dressing regulation, which is you know, related to, but a little bit separate from um, the history of uh, sodomy regulation. And I, I, later on, if, if there are questions, I'm really happy to talk about the background of, those law, of these laws and what enforcement looked like, um, which I know is a little bit also in the exhibit. Um, but I thought I would just give a short talk about uh, the process of repealing those laws uh, in this kind of in the spirit of, of what the exhibit's about. So in the early afternoon of March 24th, 1964, John Miller was approaching his home on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. He had just crossed the intersection of West End Avenue and 91st Street when a police officer stopped him and asked his name. When he replied, Joan Miller, he was taken into custody. Miller, later described by the New York Times as a tall, burly man of 58, was a father with a military record. He was also a transvestite or cross-dresser, which meant that he enjoyed dressing as a woman. At the time of his arrest, Miller was carrying a purse and wearing women's clothes, including high heels and a fur cape, as well as a gray lady's wig, giving the police officer the impression that he was an elderly woman. His crime was violation of Section 8877 of New York State's vagrancy law, then over a century old, which made it illegal to appear in public with one's face painted, discolored, or concealed, or being otherwise disguised in a manner calculated to prevent being identified. While the law did not explicitly reference clothing, and you'll notice that's a theme across this kind of regulation, they're not, you know, they don't explicitly say homosexuality either. Um, by 1964, the police, of course, often used it to arrest cross-dressers, and courts usually accepted that interpretation. But starting in the late 1960s, criminal defendants began to succeed in their judicial attacks on cross-dressing bans in a wide range of cities, from New York and Los Angeles to Toledo and Champaign and Havana, and of course, also Chicago, which I'm gonna focus on here. They used constitutional arguments that were developed in other contexts, um, and defendants challenged the assumption that cross-dressing was a crime of deception or that it was associated with stigmatized homosexuality. Instead, they drew on the popularity of unisex clothing, movements for free expression, and what Joanne Meyerowitz has called the taxonomic revolution in sexology to argue that cross-dressing could be a benign fashion choice, a protected expression of trans identity, or a necessary medical treatment for transsexuality. So by 1980, criminal defendants had successfully challenged anti-cross-dressing arrests in at least 24 cities, introducing courts to transvestite and transsexual people in the process. And as anti-cross-dressing uh, re regulation receded, those trans people built off the foundation of these challenges to make increasing affirmative demands for rights and recognition by the state. Okay, so like, why is it interesting to look at the fall of these, these laws? Well, historians usually describe gay and lesbian civil rights movement emerging from the ashes of gay liberation in the early 70s, and kind of really only talk about the T being added on to LGBT in the 1990s. But I, I argue that instead, campaigns for trans and gay civil rights emerge separately, but in tandem around the same time. Gay rights lawyering in this period emphasized the idea that gay people constituted a distinct minority um, or in the language of constitutional law, a discrete and insular minority. But in the archives, I found challenges to cross-dressing bans often succeeded 
without analogizing gender nonconformity to identity-based minority groups. So gender outlaws strategically deployed and obscured their identities, exploiting confusion about gender bending and playing off of court's ignorance. These efforts met with mixed success. Courts began to recognize constitutional rights, but litigation also limited which gender outlaws would benefit. Examining their legal strategies offers us a window into that messy process of translating gender nonconforming experiences into something that courts could understand. And it also emphasizes the role that legal institutions alongside social life and medical discourse can play in shaping these analytical categories of gender that we still live with. So over time, one strand of gender outlaw experience emerged as a figure that courts could understand as a rights-bearing subject, which I call the trans legal subject. And that's the narrower version. So the longer piece that this all uh, comes out of uh, traces three major constitutional arguments that brought down anti cross dressing ordinances, uh, which included void for vagueness and cruel and unusual punishment. And today, I'm going to focus on the line of cases that put Illinois at the center of the story. And those are arguments based in constitutional protections for free expression derived from both the first and the 14th amendments. So in the 60s, constitutional protections for free expression expanded to include new recognition of the right to control one's personal appearance. And some lawyers seized on those developments to argue that cross-dressing was a component of personal expression for their clients. By doing so, they were able to shift the legal meaning of cross-dressing um, away from its association with gender fraud and start to carve out protections for nonconformity of gender in its own, on its own terms. So I have to give a little bit of context about what the, what the state of con law is in, in First Amendment and 14th Amendment personal expression law to, to make to this case to make sense. So I'll try to be brief and, and succinct, but, but not, bear with me a little bit. Um, right, so in the late 60s, uh, the Supreme Court uh, was forced to grapple with the extent of First Amendment protections for a whole you know, range of protests arising out of the Vietnam War. Um, and uh, it ruled uh, in 1969 in a very famous case called Tinker v. Des Moines, Illinois Independent Community School District that um, students wearing black armbands at school were protected symbolic conduct. And a really important part of that case was the court's assertion that the armbands were protected even though it made other students um, uncomfortable or, or might make the staff, staff found it distasteful. Um, and that, that coincided with a case a few years later called Spence v. Washington, where the court also found that a student had a right to fly the American flag upside down outside his dorm room um, under the First Amendment. So previous decisions had defined the limits of what constituted speech, but these cases expanded First Amendment protections to expressive forms of symbolic conduct, including some elements of personal appearance, right, like wearing an armband. Um, at the, around the same time, federal courts are getting inundated with cases brought by public employees and prisoners and members of the military and also public school students against male dress and, and grooming codes. So their victories also helped expand constitutional protections for personal appearance under a different set of constitutional arguments emanating from the due process clause of the 14th Amendment. Um, these cases are often grouped together as and called the long hair cases, and they culminated in Kelly v. Johnson, which reached the Supreme Court in 1976. Uh, in that case, uh, there, was a, there was a patrolman's challenge to his department's requirement that male police officers be always clean shaven and keep their hair short. So the officer actually lost his case, but it gave the court an opportunity to recognize some kind of liberty interest within the 14th Amendment in matters of personal appearance for the first time. Okay, so taken together, we have Tinker and the Kelly decisions. They seem to kind of suggest that personal appearance was constitutionally protected to some extent, although the precise contours were unclear. But two trans women and their very young lawyers decided to test those limits in a groundbreaking challenge called Chicago v. Wilson. The case began when two plainclothes officers arrested Wallace Wilson and Kim Kimberly as they left a breakfast restaurant in downtown Chicago. According to the police, Wilson was wearing a black knee-length dress, a fur coat, nylon stockings, and a black wig. Kimberly had a bouffant hairstyle and was wearing a pantsuit, high heels, and makeup. At the station, the officers forced Wilson and Kimberly to disrobe and photograph their genitals. Um, and they decided to fight the horrible arrest and that kind of abuse. So they asked the legal assistance clinic at Northwestern to represent them. The legal team, which included a recent uh, graduate, Thomas Garrity, and some law students, Wendy Metzler and Daniel Schwartzman, decided to really aggressively fight the arrest. And their legal argument was innovative in the ways it was both broad and narrow. So, it was couched in capacious terms as constitutional protection for an individual's right to cross-dress. In other words, a broad protection that wasn't about their individual identities. It was, um, it was the, this, this uh, right to a certain kind of conduct. 
but it was also fueled by something narrower, by the expressive importance of cross-dressing for these defendants in particular as trans women. So they strategically highlighted the stakes of the right at issue, but they limited gender outlaws to that legal subjectivity defined by medical transsexuality. Um, and at trial, Wilson and Kimberly explained that they wore women's clothing not with any intent to conceal, as the law put it, conceal their sex, but with an intent to express it. Both Wilson and Kimberly testified that they were transsexuals and that dressing in women's clothing was part of their treatment. Um, Wilson told the court, quote, I feel more comfortable in the clothes I was arrested in because that is the way I like to dress. I consider myself female, but I am male. Wilson and Kimberly hoped to show the judge that their expressive conduct was following doctor's orders. The judge was unconvinced, however, ruling that the ordinance properly regulated public conduct and could be upheld since Wilson and Kimberly, quote, intended to conceal the fact that they are males, and he fined them each $100. But the, the legal team decided to appeal and it took the case all the way to the Illinois Supreme Court, where they tried a, a bunch of different constitutional arguments, hoping that one would stick. One of the really impressive things about the brief in this case is that they really educated the court about the developing science of gender identity, um, including an extensive appendix with medical research from Harry Benjamin and other leading sexologists, a uh, publication of the Gender Identity Clinic at Johns Hopkins, which was the first one in the country, um, and an activist group's uh, pamphlet called Information on Transsexuals for Law Enforcement Officers. So bringing medical definitions of transsexuality into the courtroom in a certain way it made it easier for the judge to see a contradiction between the standards of medical care that required cross-dressing and, and the city law that criminalized it. Um, and in their substantive due process argument, the lawyers articulated, again, this expansive view that the Constitution protects the right to dress as one pleases. For Wilson and Kimberly, that right was all the more important because they were trans women who were, quote, psychologically compelled to engage in such, such expression through dress and hairstyle. And they embedded a First Amendment argument in that larger claim by analogizing the right to expression and clothing to symbolic speech communicating that Wilson and Kimberly were women. So in other words, cross-dressing was not an attempt to conceal their sex, but could be a part of trans identity. And they said, you know, you can use the rule of tinker to find that Chicago cannot suppress the idea conveyed by Wilson and Kimberly's dress, even if some members of the public don't like it. And so the Supreme Court of Illinois held that the Chicago anti-cross-dressing ordinance was unconstitutional as applied to people like Wilson and Kimberly, as applied to trans people, because it violated their substantive due process right to dress as they pleased. Uh, Justice Moran, who wrote the decision, actually conducted some of his own research on transsexuality in the law, and he cited three law review articles that hadn't been in the defendant's appendix for the proposition that cross-dressing was a part of trans medical treatment. Um, and so the decision was really a landmark victory for trans rights. It is in a few uh, textbooks, although I think it should be in a lot more of them. Um, and it meant that the law could no longer be used to arrest trans people for cross-dressing in the city and started to enshrine a positive perception of trans people in the state law and order. But there's another sense in which the defendants' uh, arguments worked a bit too well. So as I've been saying, the lawyers really wanted to underscore the liberty interest in clothing and that it had particularly deep stakes for their clients. So they conveyed cross-dressing as primarily a part of medical treatment for transsexuals. And that logic structured the decision, which had the effect of limiting its protections to cross-dressing motivated by transsexuality as a medical pathology. In other words, legal legibility came at the price of a limited trans legal subject. If you didn't have to fit the bill of a trans person seeking particular kinds of medical interventions under, you know, and, and, and with the approval of the of medical authorities, it would be much more difficult to get these kinds of protections. So you know, it really reinforced the idea that trans identity was determined by doctors and therefore implicitly defined against other gender outlaws. But it did defend the liberty to choose one's clothing um, for, for you know, a significant number of people who were targeted by police quite actively. So, okay, so, you know, zooming out from the case, what can we take from the broad sweep of challenges that gender outlaws brought to cross-dressing bans? And I think one of the most exciting things is being able to identify a distinct trans legal movement. What really sets trans legal history apart in this period is not that they're the targets of cross-dressing prosecution. There were lots of people who we would not now call uh, trans uh, people, you know, people identified as, as, uh, as gay or otherwise non-conforming who were of course arrested under these laws. Um, and nor, nor is it really original, uh, the, the constitutional amendments that were used by the lawyers. Um, I think what's, what's original and interesting here is that the, is the expansive legal imagination whose arguments encompassed a wide variety of gender outlaws and the fact that those arguments sometimes won. Um, these, the most intriguing arguments, as I've said, are those 
that came in the substantive due process and free expression claims, where lawyers really tried to translate gender nonconforming lives into legal terms without losing too much in the process. And you know, as the Wilson case shows, there was there was you know, some mixed results uh, of that of that attempt. But unlike gay and lesbian legal strategy from the homophile movement forward, those cases were an attempt for gender outlaws to find constitutional safe safe harbor without defining themselves always against their less respectable siblings, and sometimes without defining themselves at all. So gender outlaws may have been left out of the increasing legal definition of homosexuality, but they were not left behind. Um, is a, a, on top of being a fantastic person, a fantastic academic, all their research is wonderful, um, and we should definitely look into what they're doing um, and, if, and when they are publishing soon. Um, so thank you again so much, Kate. The next person that we're going to uh, give the mic to to talk a little bit um, about the grassroots um, archival work that he does is Mr. Owen Keenan, that is uh, sitting directly to my Is this okay to hear? Yeah. Okay. person that's running around um, in a beautiful blue uh, dress um, is our uh, social media content manager, wears a lot of hats here at Everhart, and she's been doing a wonderful job. You will see all her posts on Instagram. She's really big into reels right now. Her reels are doing very well. She um, updates us every hundred views. Um, but thank you so much, Jen. And now I think Owen is, is ready for his presentation, and then we'll get to the official exhibit opening. It's just the arrows. This is Robert and his friend Tom. And after Tom died, this picture was in his estate. And it's just one of those things that the person going through it knew that I was working on this. Otherwise, you know, people, uh, if there's not a place or repository for their things, a lot of times they don't end up where they should. sunshine when our bars still had blackened windows. Can you imagine how empowering that must have felt after years of oppression to be queer and to be outdoors, out of the shadows with your lover or your friends in a place where you didn't have to worry, where you were free to be yourself, 
The importance of that kind of empowerment after decades of oppression cannot be overestimated. It is the definition of, of a floodgate, and the Belmont Rocks were right there at the center of it. Community happened on the rocks and on the green. Relationships and friendships happened here. Hookups, unions, LGBT sports, parties, rallies, and memorials. Gay bars and organizations had cookouts and picnics here. The After Pride Parade Party, primarily for people of color who felt excluded by the North Halstead scene, was held here for almost 25 years. Frankie Knuckles played music out at the back of a van. It was a dance party with food, but it was also an event that provided HIV testing and community outreach. In 2001, the event was relocated to Montrose Harbor. Public safety was the reason that was cited. Uh, apparently having all the action on Halstead Street as well as at the Belmont Rocks the same day was, was just too much, so we had to move out of the precinct. The Belmont... Sorry, Owen. <laughs> closed, some came here to watch the sunrise. Next. Now this is from 1976. This is a swimsuit where photo shoot for Gay Chicago Magazine. This is Ralph Paul Gerhardt in a Speedo, if anyone remembers the publisher. I don't know if anyone will here. I'm Ralph Paul, anyway. Uh, next. Okay. Artwork covered many of the stones here making the Belmont Rocks a sort of functional, open-air, queer art gallery. Everything from elaborate murals to two pairs of initials in a heart. Next, please. Although these eight-foot limestone slabs were covered with artwork, they were also exposed to Chicago's lakefront, which meant that most of it only lasted a few seasons. Next, please. The rocks inspired art as well. This is. Uh, this is one of John Reich's news, of news who was a local artist who died of AIDS in um, 90, 92 or 93. Um, and this is his painting called The Belmont Rocks. And he did, like he did the posters for the Broadway Art Fair a lot of times. He did a lot of news sketches. Next, please. This is a piece called uh, The Belmont Rocks by Buena Silva. And something I haven't talked about, but you can see right here, this is a gun club that was just to the north of Diversity Harbor. And that closed in 1991, um, I guess when they refused to clean up some lead that was in the shot and the skeets that they were shooting into the lake. Alleged, I don't know exactly. I've heard that, I just don't know. It threw me that we're being filmed. <laughs> Sometimes the rocks were just like I mean, look at this, look at this incredible photo. It just doesn't even seem real. It's no surprise that the Belmont rocks um, were just a place that since I've started doing research and since people started telling me their stories, it was a place where a lot of people went to write, where they went to draw. They were a place of queer creativity as well. Next, please. More rocks art. And next. Since starting this project, people have sent me so many photos. What happened was 
I took a picture of what the Belmont Rocks look like now and juxtapose it to what they look like then. Like no people on it, nothing. And just said, are the rocks dead? And then people started responding by, by um, when I started sharing more photos with their photos and stories. Next, please. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so this is my transition photo. These two guys in the Glory Hole Speedos, which was a bar, uh, <laughs> is going to be my launching pad into um, the decoded version of tonight, Surviving the Laws of Sexual Deviant. Um, next, please. So thanks to Gerber Hart, not only for the invitation for tonight, but also because this invitation made me look at the Belmont Rocks in a completely different way. I, I used to think, people ask, why, why did they happen here? And the answer, the easy answer is always, because it was close proximity to a large gay population. There were really heavy gay cruising areas, um, like the, Bel the Lincoln Park bushes nearby. But now I'm starting to look at it differently, more as a um, strategic place. And it's interesting because the Belmont Rocks really hold up nicely. First of all, to, to get through this, kind of, it has to be emphasized again and again that it was not a surveillance culture. That changed everything. The fact that this place could exist and people could go there and not be recorded, being there, you know, photos, but like very little film footage. Joan Jet Black did her campaign photo one of her campaign photos at the Belmont Rocks, but I think that's about the only film footage I know. Next. Okay, so strategically, uh, one of the things that made the Rocks good was that they had what, um, what I'm gonna call uh, topographical invisibility, which means, I don't know if it's a thing, but if it's not, I'm making one. <laughs> so if like you're standing here and looking down this row of rocks, there are going to be little pockets of invisibility where you can't be seen in the sideline. Next, please. So this is, I'm down by the water in this shot, but this shows you, like a lot of them weren't that deep, but they could be that deep. So if I was, say, to be involved in um, deviant behavior, <laughs> I could only really be seen from where this photo's taken from, or the water. So it was very, um, it was very strategic that way. Next, please. Who, who's in the photo, Owen? Who's that in the photo? That's me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Owen tried to, to really just slide that one in. <laughs> <laughs> no pun intended. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> and and uh, when you start to think of it as a, uh, as a fortress, it kind of really holds up. I mean, you've got the Belmont, or the Diversity Harbor to the south, you've got the Belmont Harbor to the north, you've got the water to the east, to the west you have a bike path, and then you have that long stretch of green. Next, please. Okay. So, these guys on the top row, okay. Yes, this one is probably cruising. This one, too. This one, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, what they're also doing is any cops that come have to come off the bike path on a vehicle, go across that long green, and what would happen is these people were also a kind of sentinels. They, would, they weren't going to let just anyone come up and, and disrupt the, the life here. I mean, they, people genuinely had each other's back, where a warning would be sounded to stop your behavior. <laughs> Next, please. So if the cops did come, like I said, there would be a warning sent out for people to stop their behavior. Okay, next, please. Um, seen as sexual outlaws, we felt an allegiance to one another that grew stronger because in places like the Belmont Rocks, we were our own kind of self-protected unit. We were responsible for each other. So it wasn't a venue or a bar, it was all of us kind of working the door and playing lookout for some degree. Next, please. Okay, these next four pictures are, were taken by Jerry Pritikin in 1975. 
And this is an arrest at the Belmont Rocks. So this guy in the Speedo is getting led away in handcuffs. Next, please. There he's getting handcuffed. Sorry, I'm that's me. But that's me. There is the presence, the police presence. Next. And there he is being put in the police car. Now, according to what was told to me, can anyone get, and if you know this, because I posted about it before, don't answer, but can you guess what he did? He was selling sandwiches on public property without a license. <laughs> so he was led away in a Speedo to town hall. And but I mean, look, what could, what could he possibly, what was in his picnic basket? <laughs> to have that kind of presence, it's crazy. It's insane. I mean, that, the thing is, is like, the fact that it wasn't a surveillance culture means stuff like this is completely rare. It's hard, not that many people had a camera, and it wasn't exactly an era where, you know, a lot of people were willing to maybe photograph things like this going on. Next, please. Okay. Uh, above all, the Rocks were just a queer space with a key role in the evolution of Chicago's LGBTQ history and an important chapter in our social history at risk of slipping through the cracks. Next, please. Um, places like Gerberhart preserve our past. It's our responsibility to maintain and preserve our, our history for future generations of LGBT folks. I mean, future generations aren't going to do this for us. And especially at a time when, you know, most people want to shove us back in the closet, not most, I shouldn't say that, when certain entities want to shove us back in the closet and nail it shut. Next, please. But, you know, these people need to know that we've faced greater challenges. The lesson from our past, and one we need to hear today more than ever, is that we are a community of survivors, and our story is one of perseverance and strength. In 2003, the Belmont Rocks were bulldozed um, as part of the shoreline revetment by order of the Army Corps of Engineers. Next, please. So the Belmont Rocks are gone, but on June 2nd of this year, AIDS Garden Chicago opened in that green area that's adjacent to where the Belmont Rocks were. So the garden seems a fitting place to sort of, I don't know. The Belmont Rocks are gone, but it's a way to sort of continue the importance of the place in the community. So that's really what I have right now about this iconic place known as the Belmont Rocks. Um, and if you want to find out more, the easiest place is there's a Facebook page called A Place for Us LGBTQ Life at the Belmont Rocks, where I try to keep everything. And then I post a lot of stuff, too, on, on Instagram about the rocks. Anyway, thank you for having me here this evening. so much, Ellen. I love hearing about um, the rocks, and the rocks are highlighted in the exhibit. We talked a little bit about them, and you so um, expertly did encapsulate one of the sort of themes of this exhibit, is that taking from the queer histories that we are highlighting in the exhibit today can truly help us grab on to those sort of guerrilla tactics that our queer and trans testers utilized to navigate both their own social spaces, but also public, federal, and state-sanctioned entities. Um, so as of right now, we have a few minutes before um, we're going to officially open the exhibit. So if anybody has general questions about Gerber Hart, if you have any um, questions for Owen or anyone here on the panel, anything about the exhibit itself, this is the time to ask it. Anyone on Zoom as well can also pose questions. So the floor is open. I'm actually going to call on um, a local celebrity. Mr. David Steinecker, would you like to ask a question? I saw no, your hand go up. No, there's an interesting aside, uh, <laughs> because I'm older than anybody else here. Um, 
the rocks were all David, I think uh, we're going to bring you a, a, a microphone. And because there's so many people here, we're like, oh, we might not need a microphone. No, you all showed up. So everybody that <laughs> talks today is going to get a microphone. So thank all you. Right. Go ahead, David. OK. I don't know much about these things. Anyway, <laughs> uh, the rocks were also uh, the location of a naval missile site uh, that was there until uh, the middle of the 60s, which is when I was introduced to the rocks. And it's just an interesting aside, and it was kind of fun to see the uh, flirtations between the uh, men in uniform and uh, some of the men in uniform. <laughs> 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 that, is, that is an awesome little bit of anecdotal evidence. Do you, have you heard stories? Owen's heard stories <laughs> about the Nike Missile Center. Anybody else um, have any uh, anecdotes that people are here that experience the rocks or have certain ties to this exhibit? If they're in the back. I have a, I have a question for Owen. Um, Owen, where did you, uh, how did you acquire many of these photos? Um, like I said, when I posted the original, uh, when I posted the original, photo on Facebook comparing the rocks today with what they were like. I got home that day and then I posted probably like five or six pictures of my friends there. And then I said, you know, people started responding and then it just became sort of a thing where I said, okay, you can put up a Facebook page that's going to be called A Place For Us and I'll keep them there. And then originally, it was going to be this big, incredible scrapbook to the community. And that's a matter of funding because getting any kind of book about this, it would have to be in color. And the thing is with that, different, that many different types of photography, it would just outprice every person who, should prob who would probably want the book. So right now it's in the process of looking for a grant. Anyone? <laughs> and that's a, a bigger testament to the, having these um, accessible online, but also highlighting them in, in smaller exhibits like this to get people to, to come and um, be able to enjoy them. And also, you get to one. Oh, I just wanted to add one more thing is that with doing that too, I didn't mean to, to say that it had uh, been such a long, it was more like everything was going along at kind of a pace, and then, you know, COVID happened. Yeah, exactly. Put a stop to a, a lot of things. Yes. Anybody else have dying questions in the audience? Yes. Of course. Real quick, because it seems like the opportune time. <laughs> Before I fail to mention how you could donate. As, as Owen and our, as our team mentioned earlier, um, it's, you know, all of preserving this history, it takes money, it takes a good environment where we can control the, uh, the temperature and the humidity of the space so we can make it open and available to researchers like these wonderful people to my left here. Um, so if you feel so inclined, we've got a Lucite box there at the bar. But if you have cash, you can make a donation. We also have these fabulous, yes, our bartender is <laughs> giving us chance. Thank you for the incredible. Uh, the incredible service tonight. Uh, we also have a QR code, which you'll find around the library tonight, so you can make all sorts of donations. I do hear you get extra drink tickets, depending on your donations. But really, I mean, it, it's so important because, you know, in the next coming years, we want to be able to expand our staff so that we can continue to do things like this. We will be looking for a new home eventually, so, you know, to, to house all of these things. And, uh, and yeah, to continue the incredible work that's already being done by the people that are presenting to you today. So just wanted to make sure that I got that part in. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you so much, James. Um, so I think what we can do right now, question in the red shirt? I think there's a microphone coming to you. Just wait awesome. one second. Thank you, Jules, for bartending yes. so much. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm um, Daryl Gordon. I'm um, an act so I, activist with uh, Ola and I. We used to be an act up together. Uh, I just want to say that first of all. And um, my, my one question is: uh, Do you uh, have pictures from the um, uh, Black Pride uh, parties uh, from the Belmont Rocks? 
those are, I'm working with Tracy to get the Windy City Times and outlines before that tended to do pretty good coverage. So I'm working with them too. I hope to be working with them in the future. Again, a lot of the stuff that sort of would move anything forward is mainly the funding now to, to figure out how to put it in a cohesive book. Do we have other? Do we have any other questions here? I thought I saw your hand. Okay, sorry. Climb over everyone. And make sure if you're not already, follow Owen Keenan on Instagram. He posts incredible stuff every day. Hi, Owen. I was just wondering, are you uh, familiar with the, the photographer who did a number of photographs? Uh, about, about 18 years ago, there was an exhibition about the Belmont Rocks, and a, a book actually uh, produced out of that exhibition. Just curious if you know about that photographer and where is he today? Oh, sure. Um, the photographer is Doug Ishar, and his photographs, his book is called Marginal Waters, and I think it came out, was it 18 years? Yeah. Um, that's a shot here, it's a shot. But um, they're beautiful, beautiful photos. He went down there every nice day in 1985 and took pictures at the Belmont Rocks. And then these pictures are collected in this beautiful little exhibit book um, that's unfortunately out of print now. But yeah, his, his photos are so stunning. And there's so much going on in them. Um, so, any other questions? We're really excited to open this exhibit for you. I think we also have some stuff going on in the, the circulating library room. There's reproductions of some of the stuff we have in our archives and special collections for you to take a look at. We're so much more than just this small exhibit that you're going to go through today. We do have a circulating library for anyone that uh, wants to come in. We don't, we aren't a part of CPL, but we do our own circulation. So we have books for you to take home today. Well, maybe not today. Anyway, um, <laughs> we can get you signed up today, no problem. <laughs> um, so yeah, we're an archival research center as well as a library, and we're very, very excited to open this exhibit for you to take. Thank you for all your patience, your passion, and to anyone that donated or is intending to donate, thank you and thank you in advance. So welcome officially to Decoded, Surviving the Laws of Sexual Deviant. The exhibit is going to be, I think, officially opened and unlocked and lights are on straight through that door and on your right where you came up in the elevator or the stairs. So enjoy everybody, get some drinks. <laughs> if you do have questions for any of the curators, we're gonna be hanging out. Um, we're gonna be talking to our partners and our friends and our loved ones. So we'll be here throughout the entirety of the exhibit. Thank you again, Wit, Anna, and Jess. I <laughs> Thank you everybody.